Welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Mark 15, lesson 43. We are nearing the end of the Gospel of Mark. Now, just yesterday in Mark 14, we were talking about Jesus. He really had two words, two instructions <laughs> to his disciples. He was going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're there as well. And he just said, guys, I need you to stay awake. Stay awake. Three times they heard this over and over and over again. And on the third time, he said, it's, it's crazy, at the end of Mark 14, he said, now I am now being betrayed. Like it's happening right now. And Judas shows up in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what do you know? Jesus is handed over. That's the beginning of where we're going to go today. Now, Mark 15, verses 1 through 5, Jesus faces Pilate. It says, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. And they have a discussion. They have a dialogue. And then in verse 6, it says, at the festival, Pilate's custom was to release for the people a prisoner they requested. And it came down to two guys, Jesus or Barabbas. And so in verses 6 through 15, you see and hear about this dialogue that's starting to take place. And what do you know? Who, who does the crowd choose to release? Barabbas. The craziest thing. And after they released Barabbas in verse 12, Pilate asked everybody. He said, okay, what then do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? And in verse 13, they shouted, they screamed, crucify him. And you just kind of think, God, man, they just let go Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted again, crucify him. And so you could just sense the, the tension, the anger. And then in verse 15, willing, Pilate says, to gratify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. So we've talked about this, about how Jesus then is being set up. Kevin, how many times? Three times he had predicted he was going to be uh, killed, buried, and resurrected. And in this process, he talks about even going to be mocked, going to be flogged, it's going to be spit on. He handed him over to be crucified. It's just kind of crazy to me how here he is in verses 16 through 20. He's living out all of these prophecies. The Messiah is living out the prophecies that say he's going to suffer. Do you guys remember in the argument of James and John, Sons of Thunder? Remember this? They're like, oh yeah, you go through this and then we're going to sit at the right hand and the left hand. And he says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to take? Can you participate in the baptism that I'm going to participate in? And it was kind of like, do you really, are you really ready to go through the suffering and the death that I'm going to experience? And right here in Mark 15, he begins to walk this out. And then you have in verses 21 through 32, the actual crucifixion. And then it says all the way to verse 33, it says, When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And the crucifixion had, had taken place and Jesus is on the cross and the death of Christ took place. And you see that specifically in verses 33 through 41. Why do I go through this part? a lot more fast, faster than maybe everything else. Because up until this point, remember Mark 10, 45? Mark 10, 45, if you go there, Kevin, it, it talks about like this was Jesus's end goal. We've been talking about the death, burial, and resurrection over and over and over again. In Mark 10, 45, he's describing this to his disciples. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And what was his way and how could he serve? Was and to give his life a ransom for many. So now that the death has taken place, it says in verse 41, when he was in Galilee, they would follow him and help him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. There's this crowd that's beginning to like, okay, where, what is going on? What just took place? And we're going to talk specifically today about Jesus's burial. And then how do servants that were with Christ in his lifetime how do servants then again serve the living king? Now, we talked about yesterday, how did his disciples, how were they asked? Well, they were asked to serve Jesus by staying awake. And then aside from staying awake, they were asked to, to pray. I want to walk through now that Jesus, in this context right now, Jesus is dead. We haven't found out about the resurrection yet, but we know that he's been crucified. And I want to talk about the essential connection, okay? And I, there's an essential connection between the death and the resurrection. And what we're going to talk about today is that one connection is the burial. It says this in verse 42. When it was already evening, 
Because it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Remember, if he's talking to a Gentile audience, if he's talking to a Roman group, he needs to make sure that they understand that the crucifixion actually took place on Friday, right? It says it was in preparation day, the day before Sabbath. So crucifixion, that's why we call it Good Friday. So this is where you would get it. It was preparation day. Good Friday was the day that it took place. Scripture continues on in verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. I want to kind of walk through all this process. Arimathea, uh, from what we know, from what we can even guesstimate, is, is a town 25, 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Okay. Now, when you describe uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, okay, uh, what are some things that first come to your mind, Kevin? Rich, first things that just come to your mind about this guy? He was well known. He was well known. Who was he a part of? What was he a part of? The Sanhedrin, right? What was the Sanhedrin known for? <laughs> anything. You can say anything that comes to your mind. What were they known for? Weren't they part of the group that were not, they didn't want to, they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. Look at this, Kevin. Can you go to Mark 15, 1? A prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Now watch this. In, in uh, Mark 15, 1, it says, As soon as it was morning, the chief priests had a meeting with the elders, the scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin. After tying Jesus up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Joseph of Amarathea, okay, all of a sudden, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. If you took Mark 15, 1, and then you took Mark 15, 43, without knowing any other backdrop, you'd have to say he was a part of this. I'm not saying he was, I'm just saying that's the Sanhedrin role. The Sanhedrin role, look what they did. They, they tied him up. Now it says, go back to Mark 15, 1, Kevin, please. It says, after tying Jesus up, they handed him and gave him the pilot. So this man, Joseph of Marathia, a prominent member, a prominent member to me means he's a leader. This guy is known within the Sanhedrin. And it says he is looking forward to the kingdom of God. Now, how do, what else do we know about Joseph of Marathia? If you'll go to John 19, verse 38. This is pretty cool to me. John 19, verse 38 says this. After this, Joseph of Marathia, same story, right? Just different perspective. Who was a disciple of Jesus. Remember, he's also a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. <laughs> but secretly, because of his fear of the Jews... He asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he took his body away. So here you have a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, and he's also a disciple of Christ, which means there can be followers of Jesus even in the Jewish community, according to this, according to this verse. Now, he was quiet about it. He was secret about it. Why? Because he was afraid of how the Sanhedrin would react. I think this is pretty fun. Kevin, can you go to Luke 23, verse 51? Luke 23, verse 51, again, another perspective, another angle, okay? Uh, go to verse 50, if you would, just to back up. There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, verse 51, who had not agreed with their plan and action. So he was not a part of and didn't like the fact that they were going to what? tie Jesus up, to hand him over to Pilate. So we know in Luke 23, that was the perspective. He's from Ar Arimathea, a Judean town. And it always says he's looking forward to the kingdom of God. Why do you think that's important? You guys got any ideas? Rich, Kevin, why? Why, why is this important to everything we're talking about? It's, he had vested interest in Christ and what he had been teaching about. Because he taught his, his whole ministry had been talking about the kingdom of God. So. so what he's about to do, is it fair to say he's driven by because he's looking forward to the kingdom of God? He knows about the predictions. You know that he knows about the predictions. Death, burial, and what? Resurrection. 
He's looking forward to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, in order for it to take place, the resurrection has to take place. So what is the essential part between death and, and resurrection? Burial. Because he has this perspective, he is going to get prepared for more of the kingdom of God. I think this is an incredible picture about a man within the Sanhedrin. He is a secret disciple of Christ, doesn't agree with the fact that they're killing him, that they're going to turn him over and, and crucify him. And so this is what he does. It says he comes boldly to Pilate. And it says he asked for Jesus's body. If Joseph came to... Um, Pilate, all I would say is this, it took radical courage. It took radical boldness. Why? Because to go to Pilate, you are automatically saying what? You're, you're saying you followed Jesus. You're in, a, you're in alignment, right? With who you just crucified. Verse 44, it says this, Pilate, well, we know that Jesus, we know that he asked for Jesus' body. And I think to me, when I hear this language, can you go to Mark 8, 34? Whenever I start praying through and processing the life of Joseph of Amarathia, I go to this picture. Mark 8, verse 34. We talked about this, you guys, about a week ago. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples. And you wonder if, if Joseph heard these words. If anybody wants to be my follower, he must deny himself. Well, <laughs> check. <laughs> that would be Joseph. If he's willing to radically go before Pilate, he's now saying the Sanhedrin part is not that important, right? That's that obstacle that's between him and Christ to follow him. He's now saying that doesn't, I'm okay if I'm getting rid of that identity. Then it says, take up his cross. If you want to be my follower, take up your cross. I am, I'm willing to identify myself with this Christ, this King of Jews that my own people killed. I'm willing to say, I'll die for it. I'm willing to say I'll die for his body. And then I'll do it so much so that I'll even follow Christ to even where he's buried. When I think of Mark 8, 34, I can't think of a better person than Joseph of Marathia in this. He's letting all of it go. And so in verse 44, I mean, that's what you see. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, Kevin. Charge of a hundred. Yeah, the soldiers in charge of a hundred guys. Not, he, he, not 144. Pilate asked this guy in charge of a hundred soldiers, he asked him whether or not Jesus, this Jesus was already dead. And it was a surprise, okay, uh, that he was already dead because he shouldn't be dead already, right? Normally when you're on the cross, when you go through this cru crucifixion, normally, like it's a long, arduous, suffering process. And so what they were going to do is, remember, they're going to actually break the bones. You remember this? In order to happen before Sabbath. So they, they didn't have to do anything during the day, uh, the next day. But they asked him whether or not he had already died. In verse 45, it says, when he found out from the centurion, well, what did he find out? He found out he was dead. He gave the corpse. It's the only time in scripture Jesus' body is defined and described as corpse here. He gave the corpse to Joseph. And again, it's very, very unusual as one of the commentators, uh, Weasel, Weasel, <laughs> unusual to give the corpse the body of a person condemned for treason. That's what Jesus would have been considered for treason to anyone but the near relative. So just to think through this process, I mean, just the fact that Joseph was given the body is radical in itself. Maybe if, Mar maybe if Mary asked, maybe if Joseph asked, but no, Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, and that's as, that's as radical a as it is. But I think Pilate didn't believe that Jesus was guilty of treason, which is why I think he gave up the body. I think Pilate knew whether he believed it or not, I think he knew who Christ was in the sense of who he claimed to be. Verse 46, it just says this. After he bought some fine linen, he took him down and he wrapped Jesus, his body, in the linen. Then he placed him in a tomb cut out of the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. I'm going to walk through planning a funeral for a body at this time. Sounds kind of strange, but we have a picture over here of 
In Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem right now, outside of Old City, this place is called the Garden Tomb, okay? There's two locations that they would say Jesus was crucified and then buried. This would be one of the locations. Rich, you've been there a couple times. Why do they say that this could be the location? Do you remember? Yeah, because they said, um, one, it was a tomb that was buried inside a hill and there was a large stone uh, found close by. And the other one would be because why? Do you remember the other location? The Church of the Church Holy Sepulchre? Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, I don't remember why. Don't they say it was more because of the outside the city? Yeah, I mean, today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is inside, inside. City, wa city walls, but back then it was outside the city yeah. walls. So both locations seem so to fit that. When you walk in this door, Rich, do you have to duck? Oh, yes. This, this kind of, it's hard to tell. This kind of looks like kind of a big door. It's not. You have to actually stoop down. Okay, usually they say between four to five feet, okay, in this context right here. Probably maybe a little bit more, I'm sure. But then this over here is the stench hole. This is for once the body is in here long enough, then the stench uh, will get out so it doesn't smell so horrible when you go in to take care of the body. Uh, this is the, what we would call outside. If you want to go on the inside then, then this is what this would look like as well. Um, and so here is where the body would then actually be laying down. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea, all right? So it says this, Joseph bought some fine linen. He took him down. What would he have taken him down from? The actual cross. And then he wrapped him in linen and then he placed him in a tomb. If you can go back, he placed him in a tomb cut out of a rock. And then they rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Now, a lot of people are thinking, how can that guy do that? Because sometimes they'd say it takes 20 to 30 men just to roll that stone, that tomb. Because if it's at an angle and there's a wedge below it, it's just literally, you can just push it. But if they go back up, it's a lot harder to do that. Okay, so this is the process. Okay, so Joseph puts his body inside, right? And then in verse 47, I'm going to wrap this up and then I'm going to walk through a funeral. Okay, I think this is the burial process of how we can serve at that time. Now, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, was wa were watching where he was placed. All right. Nelson's came up with to me a, a really great commentary about the funeral plans. We know that Joseph, okay, he played a major, major part. Kevin, I want to ask you one more time. Describe Joseph again, a couple of his backdrops. So if you were to say this is who Joseph is to your sons, what would you say? Uh, he's a me prominent member of the Sanhedrin, so he's well known amongst them, and yet he's a follower of Christ. And nobody really knows. Maybe this is the first time that he begins to release, I follow this king of the Jews. It's kind of an odd time, don't you think? It's kind of an odd time to announce that he's dead. And now I'm saying I believe in him. But if you would, would you go to Isaiah 53, 9? You have to understand something. I believe Joseph and a buddy of his. Joseph and a buddy named Nicodemus. I'll get into Nicodemus here in a second. But I believe both of them actually studied and prepared for this burial. Why? Because Isaiah 53, 9, they knew the scriptures. They're members of the Sanhedrin. Uh, uh, Joseph of Marathia, he's a prominent religious guy. Isaiah 53, 9 says, They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death. Although he had done no violence, it had not spoken deceitfully. So the prophet, the prophetic word from the prophet Isaiah was that the Messiah was going to be born, or I'm sorry, was going to be buried, where? In a rich man's tomb. Well, Somebody has to step up, and you ready for this? We've been talking about this at Time Revive. Pursue prophecy. Somebody has to walk in and say, okay, I'm the rich man. I'm going to embrace, I'm going to give him the cave. Prophet's been talking about this, and Joseph, I actually believe, prepared for his burial. Now, here's the, the craziest thought. Let me tie in Nicodemus to all this, right? Joseph of Amarathia, right? He bought the fine linens to wrap the body before laying it in his very own expensive tomb. This would have been a very, very expensive tomb. Okay. Now, Nicodemus, he helped with the arrangements. Okay. Uh, he was a member. Kevin, can you go to John 19, verse 38? Nicodemus was a member of the council. Rich, do you remember a famous story of Nicodemus? 
Yeah, he came to Jesus at night and questioned him if he was the Messiah. That's right. Nick O. Demas. Wouldn't that be in John 3? Yeah, John 3, absolutely. So it says this in John uh, 19, 38. After this, Joseph of Amarathia, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gives him permission. So he comes and he takes away his body. Now watch in verse 39. Nicodemus, as rich reference, who had previously come to him at night in John 3, also came. And look what Nicodemus brought. A mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. In verse 40. Then what happened? These two guys, a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the council, they took Jesus's body and then they wrapped it in linen clothes with the aromatic, uh, aromatic spices. <laughs> I'll get there. According to the burial customs of the Jews. I'm going to talk about what that looks like. So Joseph and Nicodemus, now go to verse 41. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. Look, we don't know if this is the official place, but man, doesn't this look beautiful? A new tomb was in the garden. No one had ever yet been placed in it. Praise the Lord. Verse 42. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation and since the tomb was nearby. Two guys, Joseph and Nicodemus, religious guys, guys that have interacted with Jesus before, a disciple of Christ, one that's met with him at night up on a rooftop, they're taking the dead body, I believe, because of Isaiah 53, 9. I believe they believe they were looking forward to the kingdom of God. And so if their eyes are always on the kingdom of God, they're saying, how can I serve? And here's the weirdest task I'll serve for Jesus's burial. Wouldn't though, if they were touching the dead body, make them unclean? I mean, it could have been in that culture, absolutely. So they were even willing at that point to, who cares if I'm considered unclean? Crazy enough, think about Nicodemus. At great point, Rich, normally the body would have been washed, okay? Normally then, you would have had an anointing with the aromic, uh, ar aromatic uh, uh, spices, right? You know, those kind of things. So like the myrrh, the aloe, the spices, the ointments, all that Nicodemus brought, right? That's when they would have came. And it says they did. They put these on him, right? And then it says you would have wrapped them in cloth. Then you would have bound them with burial bandages, usually then of linen. And then you would even had a separate cloth to take the face and cover him with a separate cloth. So it's a, it's a major process. Two guys, Nicodemus and Joseph, were ready. I think in even the 75 pounds of myrrh and the spices that they had. That's a lot of spices to accumulate, wouldn't it, Ben? To totally. Now, think about this. Joseph and Nicodemus play a major part, but then let's go back here. What about the women? I'm just going to list women here because there's quite a bit of them. The women who had supported Jesus in his ministry, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Remember, they prepared spices and fragrant oils to place on the body as soon as the Sabbath was over. Remember, they were coming. They just didn't know that the work was already done. Isn't that cool, though? You think about that. Like, these guys have done it. Then these ladies are getting ready to come. And the next thing you know, the, the body is its not there. Their work they cannot do, but they were prepared and ready to do this. You know, you think about this, this stone. It probably weighed, you know, you would have seen a round stone here, one and a half to two tons. Two Georgia Tech facil uh, faculty members actually did a study on how heavy a little four foot by five foot roll, you know, stone that would have gone in front of this door. And that's, that's a crazy amount of weight. And what I love is, is that Joseph of Amarathia and Nicodemus were ready to serve, as weird as this sounds, Jesus, who at that point was a dead body. So what do we do? What do we, what do, we do with this? What do we learn from this? You know, I, I really asked the Lord a couple things. One is, is I think you can take away the servants. I think this is a fair statement. They were prepared. The way they can serve and get prepared for, uh, look forward to the kingdom of God is that they were literally prepared, right? Because how did they get prepared? Well, one, they actually, they had, a, they had let me tell you a crazy theory. One of the theories out there, I cannot prove this, 
is that Nicodemus and Joseph hid inside the tomb when all of that happened. It's a theory. So that remember when it says all of the Sanhedrin, it's a theory that they weren't there. And then when they came out right away, they went right to Pilate. There was no distractions, no interactions. I can't prove any of that. But it is an interesting concept of how prepared they were. And they had everything ready. Again, no idea, no proof. I just think it's kind of fun to present some of these ideas. But either way, we know they were prepared. And then another important part was, is that they knew the word, you guys. In order to look forward to the kingdom of God, they knew the word. If all of they had was Jesus's interactions on a rooftop where they heard things for the disciples, or maybe what if all they ever had was Isaiah 53, 9, would that be enough to convince you to say that was him? I like this and I like of these are ways to, I guess I should put up here, ways to serve or how to get ready to serve. You're prepared, you know the word. And then, you know, one of these other characteristics that I see is the boldness. I mean, I, I, I see Joseph go to Pilate who handed him over and he asks for the body. He is okay with being associated with the king of the Jews who's dead. He literally just chucked out his A-list and became a C-list guy, if not worse. He was prepared. He knew the word. He's studying the word, right? He's bold. And then there's two of them that, in my opinion, they, they go together. One of them is sacrifice. And the other one is stewardship. The guy is willing to literally give up his material possessions, maybe for his family, maybe for himself, all for the sake of the king. Mark 8, 34. Kevin, what is it? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. It's exactly what these guys are doing. Joseph and Nicodemus. They're prepared. They know the word. They're bold. They're sacrificing. And as they're sacrificing, here's the thing that I think is really important. Steward it well. Steward it well with the purpose. I believe we need to start stewarding our finances, our gifts, our material possessions in order to prepare for the coming of the king. This man right here, two men right here, actually stewarded their gifts. The myrrhs, the aloes, the spices. Spices, Rich, what do you know? Spices to get ready for the king. And then all of this, in my opinion, in order to, to serve the ultimate king, I think these guys had to have radical faith. Six simple words on how or ways that you can serve. Joseph and Nicodemus, the way they got ready for the king, they took a dead body of Jesus because they believed he was going to come alive. And that's tomorrow, Mark 16, with where we go. Thanks, guys, for Lesson 43. We'll talk to you tomorrow.